Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. And again, greetings to our visitors. It's good to see our St. Pete brothers here with us today. Very good. And of course, the Thomas family there. Dennis, Tanya, Jordan. Oof. Is that Jordan? You didn't sneak up somebody else in on me. And Ashley, of course. Welcome, welcome. It's so good to see you guys. Be able to join us on this special weekend. And, of course, tomorrow, if you've been counting, and you should have been counting, but even if you weren't counting, it's not too hard to figure out which day of the count this is, right? Brother Dennis already mentioned in his prayer, this is the seventh week, 49 day, so count number 49. And, you know, when we think about Pentecost, we realize that this holy day is unique among God's commanded assemblies. And that it is the only holy day, not on a fixed day from year to year. Right? Because the date depends on when the Sabbath day is during the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now, when we think about that, it's, it's, you know, it's just common sense to think that, well, of course, God could have set a date for Pentecost, just as he did for all the other feasts. But he does not. Instead, he instructs us to count 50 days from the Days of Unleavened Bread to determine when to keep Pentecost. So then my question for us as we consider observing Pentecost tomorrow is why do we observe Pentecost? That's a question that's been we've asked historically, but it bears asking again, I believe. Why do we observe the Feast of Pentecost? What does this day picture in God's plan of salvation. What is our role in this day? And what meaning does the Feast of Pentecost have for us? Well, in the sermon time I have this morning, I'd like to review why we keep the Feast of Pentecost. Why we keep the Feast of Pentecost. You know, for ancient Israel, of course, the Feast of Pentecost was accounting until the first fruit harvest in the late spring. And also a reminder of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Let's look at Leviticus 23. We'll pick up where this day is commanded. But we'll actually start with the wave sheaf. Leviticus 23.15. Twenty three fifteen, Leviticus twenty three fifteen. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought the sh- in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. So a Sabbath, every that the the Hebrews said a Sabbath was a week. This is another word saying week, because. Every seven was a week, so seven weeks, seven sevens, 49. And you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring it in from your dwelling places, two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. Along with the bread, you shall present seven one-year-old male lambs without defect and a bull of the herd and two rams. They are to be a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs, one year old, for a sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering with two lambs before the Lord. They are to be holy to the Lord for the priest. On the same day, you shall make a proclamation as well. You are to have a holy convocation. So this notice, brethren, this is a Sabbath. This is designated as a special convocation, a time of gathering, a time of, of uh, drawing together. 
You shall do no laborious work. It is to be a perpetual statute in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. When you reap the harvest of the land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of the field, nor gather in the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. So here we see the, the inter- God giving the day of Pentecost, the, the rules, the, the laws for Pentecost to ancient Israel. Now, the noun Pentecost literally means 50th. I think we know that. In the, in the Greek, it actually means count 50, or 50th day after the Sabbath of the Passover week. And it, so that's how we get Pentecost. That's the name in Greek. Now, let's look, speaking of Greek, let's, look, let's fast forward to, first, uh, to the first temple, uh, second temple period, rather. In the time of the apostles, let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Here we find that Israel, I mean the, the Judeans, in, were still keeping Pentecost. At this time, in the first century, when, says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all together in one place. This is all the disciples and the, and the apostles. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind that it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided, to- as divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here we see this, this pouring out of the Spirit in a special way, a special commission for the disciples and the apostles gathered there at that Pentecost in the first century. Before this time, God had given the Holy Spirit only to to select few, but never to a people, never a pouring out in such a manner as we see on Pentecost at that time. The day of Pentecost is an annual reminder that God poured out his his spirit upon his church to give them a special a special commission brethren he had just talked about that commission in 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 Matthew uh, 28 we know the, the great commission go therefore into all the world teaching them to observe all things ma- making disciples of all you know I can't uh, Go therefore into all the world, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and so forth. So this is what he's preparing his people to do, his church to do, and he's empowering them now with the means to do that. And not only the means to do that, by giving his spirit, pouring it out into his his ecclesia, his called out ones, his, his, his church, in other words. He was implanting in them his own DNA. What binds together the body of Christ to lead them. So that was what was happening so powerfully on this day in the first century. It is with this spirit dwelling in us that we are able to put into practice all God's spiritual lessons both of Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, but all His holy days, all His commandments. Not to keep them just outwardly, but inwardly, because as the tablets of stone, or as His words were written on the tablets of stone at Sinai, so on this Pentecost they were written on the human hearts to change to change us into the very to our, change our minds into the very mind of Jesus Christ. We also, of course, have evidence that the apostles continued to observe these holy days much later after after the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ in that first Pentecost. Notice First Corinthians. You don't need to turn there. Just I'll reference First Corinthians sixteen eight when Paul says, "But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost." Now this was written in 1 Corinthians was scholars believe was written between 56 and 57 AD that would be 25 
or 26 years after Christ's resurrection. So the apostles didn't obviously just toss out the holy days and the rest of the law as many Christian denominations teach us today, but they were still keeping it. Notice Acts 20, verse 16. Acts 20, verse 16. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Paul thought this was so important, brethren, to keep this day, to observe this day of Pentecost, that he would he put off going to Asia so he could get to he wanted to be in Jerusalem, if at all possible, on that day. Now, this was written about 58 A.D., or 27 years after the resurrection. And as I've said before, traditionally, ancient Israel believed that and taught that, the Jew, uh, that God gave the law at Mount Sinai on this day, on the day of Pentecost. And I've spoke on that before and showed you from Scripture how that that was very, very likely true based on what we have. And it, and it fits perfectly if we understand the giving of the law at Sinai and the giving of the Holy Spirit to write the law in our hearts. It's a perfect uh, type and a type. There's my water. <coughs> Notice Exodus. On Exodus 19, I believe. Let me see. Somebody read Exodus 19, verse 20 to me. That's the verse I want. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came out to the wilderness of Sinai. Now, what is curious about the wording of this verse is the phrase, on this very day, by Yom Hazah, which seeks to mark a specific day, yet without describing exactly which day is being referenced. Since the, only, since the only other calendar reference in this verse is in the third month, the ancient sages con consistently interpreted the meaning of this as phrase to be Israel came to the wilderness of Sinai on the, on, uh, the Rosh Kodesh Sivan, or the first day of the third month. If this interpretation is correct, then the Torah was given to Moses upon the mountain on the sixth day of the third month, that is, on the day of Pentecost. And just as we read in Acts, we know for certain that God gave his, his ecclesia, his, his chosen ones, his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The interesting common uh, connection between the two events is God's law directs us how to live and God's Holy Spirit guides us in being able to truly keep the law. Notice Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come, not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth shall pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Christ came to get, he says here quite plainly, that he came to make the law full, to make it possible to be fully kept. 
The law always pointed directly to him, and he came to magnify it. Notice it also says the law and the prophets. That's if you understood the Hebrew, what, what, the way that they heard that, they heard that as being the law and the prophets was the whole scriptures, brethren. The first five books of Moses and all the prophets, and then, of course, the writings. So the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim in Hebrew. That was the entire scriptures. He's saying, I came, all the scriptures speak of me. He goes on to, to teach the disciples on the way to Emmaus about that. But So he certainly didn't come to do away with them. He came to fill them to the full, to make it possible that we can keep them. The Father and Son always intended that the law and the Holy Spirit work together in us to reflect their nature and character. Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 verse 1. First John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know we love that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. What's more, it always, it always amazes me that when you talk to somebody of the in, in common in the common Christian community and you talk about keeping God's law and they say well we that burden has been taken off of us they've obviously not read 1 John his commandments are not burdensome in fact they're a blessing brethren God's instructions to us how to relate to him and to each other how to live a full life and anyway, for everyone who's been born and overcomes the world, and this is the victory that he that has overcome the world, our faith. Brethren, God, loving God and keeping his commandments is not fully possible without God's spirit dwelling in us. We can't do it. The Pharisees tried the be their best. They kept it down to the tithing of the mint and anus that they grew. But they were lacking the Spirit of God. So it was all just ritual. It was all just form and no substance because they lacked the very essence that would make it possible. Then both together, the law and the Spirit, being a synergy not possible with either by itself enables us to keep God's law. The events in Acts chapter 2 is one of those pivotal events in history, brethren. God had now given his Holy Spirit to a called out people and he refers to them as first fruits. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 verse 22. Romans 8, verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Notice here Paul calls the Spirit in us the, the first fruits of the Spirit. We have a small taste of that now, brethren. But in the resurrection, we will have the Holy Spirit even as much as Jesus Christ has it or had it when he walked the earth. We will have it without measure. 
Can you imagine that kind of, that, that power? It's awesome to contemplate. But we're also called the first fruits. Uh, notice James chapter 1, verse 16. James chapter 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So here we are. We have a we have the spirit is a, the first fruits of the spirit is within us, and therefore we are called first fruits of God. Look at Revelation fourteen, taking this on into the future. Revelation fourteen verse one. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's names written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. Again, this sounds like Pentecost, doesn't it? The voice I heard was like the sound of the harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. In other words, they hadn't defiled themselves with idolatry. That's, you get that, if you, that reference in the Bible. It hadn't mean that they had never had... <laughs> Uh, intimate relations on earth. It just means they hadn't defiled themselves with idolatry. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits of God, for God and the Lamb, and in their mouths no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now, brethren, so here we have, we are called first fruits. But we mustn't forget who was the first of the first fruits. There is a order of first fruits. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, those who have fallen asleep with the Holy Spirit were called first fruits, but notice this. Who was first resurrected? Who was the first of the first fruits? Who was the wave sheaf offered on that Sunday early morning? After Christ's resurrection. For as by man came death, by man also has come the, also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his order, notice this, Christ the first fruits, then in his coming those who belong to him. So we have an order of first fruits. Christ the first of the first fruits the captain of our salvation, leading us, for, and then us at his coming. Brethren, these first fruits are us, or can be us. It's not by anything special on our part. It's not because we are so wise, we're so good, we're so remarkable. No. No. It is simply by the mercy of God for us to be part of his plan at this time. For whatever reason, he is calling us now. 
He's calling a first fruits, brethren. He's calling them, preparing a people, a people to rule with him, reign with him in the millennium, to bring many sons and daughters to glory. John 6, verse 44. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. For whatever reason, brethren, God has looked down and called us now. He needed to have someone to work with now. Those who are not humble will not listen or yield to him. Those of us who have are to be the first fruits after Christ. Notice 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20. First Corinthians 1, verse 20. <clears throat> Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. I don't see any senators or congressmen in here. <laughs> I don't even see any mayors. No. And not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not. To bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. Who became to us wisdom from God. Righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. It says we are in Christ Jesus. And he is in us by his spirit. By his spirit, brethren, we are all linked together to be the body of Christ. That is how we are in him and he is in us. The same, the same kind of relationship he has with the Father. We are privileged to have with Jesus Christ right now. We have been called now to be examples to the world so that no one should boast. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Notice what it says. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you, Peter speaking to us now, brethren, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, 
But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's a quote from Hosea, chapter 2, verse 23. The world, brethren, does not understand the purpose for living. They don't understand what it's all about. Most, most people don't. They don't really understand. They don't understand the ultimate purpose of life. Even, I'm sorry to say, many in Christian circles in the world don't understand the purpose of this of life. They think it's the their end point is to be in heaven, playing on a harp, I guess, looking in the face of Christ for eternity. They don't understand that we are to be the children of God to reign with him a thousand years, then to go on from there. As a God family, filling the universe. It says, of the, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. I believe it. I take that as his word. There shall be no end of the increase of his government. God, in his wisdom, has chosen to call only a few before reestablishing his kingdom to show the rest of the world that he has not forsaken his creation and that it is possible to overcome Satan and the false way of life he promoted. Notice James chapter 1, back James chapter 1 again, verse 22. It is possible to overcome Satan with his spirit. Now that we have, now that he is, by his grace, by his, by the mercies of God, giving the Holy Spirit to his, to his called out ones now, to his first fruits, he's enabled us to keep his perfect law. And what it says, notice James 1, 22, that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently in his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the perfect law, the law of liberty, liberty, not bondage, perfect, not flawed, and, and goes on to say, and preserves being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now turn with me, if you will, to check Romans chapter 8. Let's start with verse 14. I'm going to read quite a bit here, Romans chapter 8. Romans eight fourteen. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I, that, that down payment, that first fruits of the Spirit that inhabits us, brethren, works with our spirit. In, in, a, in a symbiotic relationship so that we are truly the children of God. And if children, it goes on to say, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You ever think about that? What is Christ going to inherit? If we are fellow heirs with him, we inherit all of that too. That should boggle your mind. It does mine. It says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Brethren, we, we may have lost jobs because of the Sabbath or keeping God's holy days. 
We may have been ridiculed. We may have lost family members who disowned us or whatever because of our faith. Of course, we haven't suffered like Paul and some of the apostles have not yet anyway, but we may be called to. But regardless, whatever we've suffered, I, like Paul, consider not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Drop down to verse 22. Verse 22. We've read this already, but I'm going to read this again here, starting. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Since, the, since sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden, all of creation has suffered being in a state of decay from that time. So it says, all of creation groans together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are, were saved. Now hope is, that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Sometimes, brethren, in your prayers, you may run out of words. And you know what's important? You don't need words sometimes. God knows your heart and whatever you're feeling, and you, you can't express it. It says the Spirit intercedes <clears throat> and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes <coughs> excuse me for the saints according to the will of God and we know that for those who love God all things work together for good and those who are called according to his purpose. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn. His son be the firstborn among many brethren. The firstborn. The firstfruits among many firstfruits to come. <coughs> Excuse me. The first. The firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And, who, and those whom he predestined to be called, those also who he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son... But gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God and who indeed is interceding for us. Brethren, we have a high priest. We have an advocate before the throne of God, that no matter what accusation the enemy can bring before the throne to us, our advocate says, I paid that penalty. I cover it. My blood, I, I put my blood over this, this child. And the father says, not guilty. not guilty <clears throat> who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword we haven't had to face some of that brethren but they, they did those people to Paul whom Paul was writing this was very real for them and it may be someday for us in the not too distant future we need to remember these words, brethren. We need to find comfort in these words. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. 
We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a comfort that must have been to those believers in Rome. And what a comfort it should be for us, brethren. There will be a time when God will remove the veil from all and show mankind what true life can be like. We are learning now, as first fruits, how to be the leaders, teachers, ministers, and so forth of all those who will be given God's Spirit after us. We are just the first fruits of a harvest, brethren, a harvest that's unimaginable. We, ha- we will have the best jobs in the whole entire universe, serving all of God's people. You realize that? We're not called to be just leaders. We're called to be servants. We'll lead in the same way Christ led, by being a servant. Notice Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Hebrews 2, verse 10. This is mankind's future. For it is fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's God's plan, brethren. It's contrary to some of the theology out there, Calvinist theology, that he elected some to be saved and some to damnation, that there is no way if... If he's called you to be saved, you will be saved no matter what. And if he's called you to damnation, you can't be saved no matter what. God says his, his, his will was that all should come to salvation. He wants to bring many sons to glory. And he made our captain, our, our founder, of our salvation perfect through suffering. Notice Zechariah 14. Talking about this, the holy days. Now, I just showed from the scripture that even after the resurrection of, of the Messiah, Paul and the other apostles were still keeping the holy days Doesn't it? And notice Zechariah 14. We're keeping Pentecost, rather. So I think it just should stand to reason that the other holy that during God the kingdom, other holy days will be expected to be observed as well. And we find that, of course, in Zechariah 14, verse 16. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and keep the the feast of booze or the tabernacles. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. Then there shall be a plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations who do not go up to keep the feast of booths. So here we see plainly that in the, in, the, in the millennium, God expects all people to observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Wouldn't he expect the rest of the holy days as well? Of course he would. Notice, that, let's look back to Leviticus 23 or 21.
This is speaking about Pentecost, the day we'll observe tomorrow. It says, and you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever, forever, in all your dwellings, places throughout your generations. God's law is unchangeable. Like it's, he is unchangeable because God's law is his, it's an expression of his very nature and character. As God does not change, his law does not change. And so Pentecost is a day, is an integral part of God's holy day plan. So today, brethren, I've touched briefly on and reviewed the meaning of Pentecost from the perspective of its past, its present, and also its future. But what my main point to us today, brethren, is that we have been given the opera's, the awesome of awesome opportunity to be a part of that plan now. For we are the first fruits. We are the children of the living God. And we have an awesome opportunity tomorrow to observe and to appreciate this part, this, this, the, the awesome giving of the Holy Spirit and what it pictures not only to us, but to all mankind. So let's think about these things, brethren, as we contemplate keeping the awesome day of Pentecost tomorrow.